turn this morning in preparation for the sermon. Uh, the first one would be Hebrews 10, where Cody read this morning. Uh, if you've been here very long, you know that's one of my very favorite places in the Scriptures. Once you've found Hebrews, start working your way back to the left and find Philippians chapter 2. And then once you've marked that, then off to Romans you go. Romans chapter 13. But again, I'm so thankful for what the Lord's been doing in our midst. And I look forward to seeing what all He will do as we continue walking through this letter that He has written down for the church. Really this morning I wanted to reflect on one verse because I want to reflect on one person and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll notice in verse 14 of chapter 13, this is where we left off last week, where Paul writes in the Spirit, but. And I do want to pause with that word because in the Greek it's a very strong change of direction. He took you somewhere where you absolutely do not want to be, and that is in your flesh, in sin. And he describes that with three phrases in verse 13 where he talks about self-control with the words carousing and drunkenness. Then he talks about sexual immorality with these two words, promiscuity and sensuality. And then he talks about divisiveness or division where he talks about strife and jealousy. And those are normal attitudes and normal actions for the man who has fallen, for the man who is depraved. And so he immediately wants to change direction in a very hard way, jerk the car around, so to speak. And he says, but rather instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's talking about there is for us to put on the characteristics of Christ, to put on the disposition of Christ, to put on the qualities of Christ in all of our behavior. Certainly, if we've been born again, we have taken Christ on the inside of us and the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. He has sealed us. He has made us His own. And now He is going through the process of transforming us into that very same image so that we too, as the children of God, might reflect the character of the Son of God. And so he wants to describe that in such a way as really putting on a garment. That's the word. As you would put on a coat, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ rather than doing all these things. Now that does kind of sit in the middle. I told you when we began these verses, it really goes from chapter 12, 1, all the way to chapter 15, verse 13. And so that kind of sits in the middle of all these passages because that's really the theme. If I was going to take all the instruction out of those chapters and say, well, I need to put it in one sentence, that would be my sentence, but rather instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Now, since we're not going to be there for a few weeks, I wanted to go ahead and kind of outline 14 and 15 because I trust, and I know many of you do, will continue reading ahead. In fact, I'd encourage you to read 14 and 15 every day until we get back here where I'm preaching through these two chapters from this pulpit. So let me lay that out for you. Notice verse 1. It says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith. That word accept is repeated a number of places throughout these two chapters. In fact, if you'll notice with me over in chapter 15, verse 7, this is kind of the conclusion of the two chapters where he writes, Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now that word accept is the word that I can't just not mention until we get back together from uh, the Christmas holidays and a few things we've got scheduled for January. So I want to go ahead and hopefully grow an attitude of preciousness toward this word. It's a compound word, and the first word is pros, which means to draw near, to hold close in relationship, right? 
And, and the second word is lambano, which means to take hold of or grasp. In other words, he's not saying, I want you to tolerate one another. Because if we were to be honest, that's basically all we do. We divide ourselves up into little camps, into little groups that think like we do, that do the things that we do, that act like we do, and we stay inside of those camps. And if you're outside of our camp, then we tolerate you with a somewhat of a smile on our face. But we disobey the teaching of Scripture where it says to accept to take hold of and bring in close. To give you an illustration of this word, you know, I hug my daughters differently now that they're young women, respectfully. But I hug my son very differently. When I got home from work, I think it was Friday, he had just gotten in from school. So as I was pulling my truck in the garage, I noticed in my side view mirror, my son come out the side of the house, out of the side door, walking toward the truck. And so I immediately hopped out of the truck and started walking toward the back of the truck. And there we met. And we pulled each other in close. And we held each other. Now, if you're a parent, you know exactly how precious that is to you, especially when you had not seen them for a while. But that's a good expression of this word. I want you in close. Not only do I receive you or accept you, but I have drawn you close, near and dear to my heart. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do as the children of God. That's what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ because if you'll notice in verse 3 of chapter 14, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who does eat. We'll work all that out later, but notice the last phrase. For God has accepted him. In other words, what the Father has done to you is He has taken hold of you and He has drawn you in close to Him. He does not tolerate you. And sometimes I think we're under the impression that God just tolerates us. Because you know when our children get sideways and disobedient, we do the very best we can do to tolerate them, right? The Father doesn't do us that way. He lays hold of us, He grasps us, and He draws us in close. He receives us, He accepts us. And He says, I've accepted you in this way. See how weak that English word is? It's a shame that's all we've got. I've accepted you this way, now you accept one another just like I have accepted you. So this is why I want to go ahead and mention this to you. I wonder if we're going to do that. It's, it, it's, a, it's a joy to preach here. Because very rarely do I see someone not sitting on the edge of their seats listening to every word and if they're doing something else, I always understand. They were probably up all night long. But 99% of the time, you guys are always right there. And many times after the preaching, one of you is absolutely broken. I go back to Travis the other day. That's exactly where you want your elders to be, broken. And so you've met much of 12 and 13 with brokenness. Will we meet this with brokenness? And I say that because I've never seen a church as a whole do these things. I've just always been a part of a church where groups within the larger group drew each other in close. And then we went to our little pods all over the body. That's, that's how the body worked. I wonder if corporately we can begin to apply 14 and 15. That, that's going to be something. That's really going to be something if we can do that. But I want to go back. That's just in, just hopefully get you started chewing and digesting on what you'll find in 14 and 15. But I want to go back to 12 and 13 because it is absolutely overwhelming. I've seen it in your lives. I've heard it in testimony. I've read it in text and other conversations. The struggle that has been taking place to lay hold and take on 12 and 13. I know there's been absolute conviction by the Holy Spirit 
to break our hearts. I know I've wept many a day reading through these passages and not seeing them in my life, wanting to see them in my life. And so I wanted to really come back and encourage you this morning as we consider 12 and 13, because I think in 14 and 15 it's even going to get more difficult. So I thought it best to pause this morning and remind ourselves of some, some truths that we absolutely need to be reminded of and not get overwhelmed. And I'll tell you why we're going to get overwhelmed, and we do, because we try to do these things in our own power. You know, you read this to, to love your enemy. You read this to love your neighbor like yourself, and you're just, you're, you weep because you know you don't. And then you turn around and you make this mistake of guilt tripping yourself and putting yourself in some sort of position to actually accomplish the task, and you don't realize that you're doing it apart from Christ. And I was reminded this morning as I was thinking about this, even the Son did nothing apart from the Father. If you remember the, the high priestly prayer in John 17, that He was in the Father and the Father was in Him. And so everything the Son did, He did in union to the Father. Not even the Son would stand in independence separated from the Father. Not even the Son picked these things up and took them to task on His own. No, the Son walked in the Father as the Father was in the Son. And so you and I have to realize that what we're doing is we're taking up Christ, and you certainly can't do that apart from Christ. You must be one with Christ and in Christ. Not just from the point of justification, but from the point of walking in daily life, not separating your thoughts your actions or your mind from Him, not even for one breath. It's a picture of absolute dependence on the Son as we begin to walk these things out. So I want to remind you of those things, and hopefully you will gain a better perspective as you try to obey these exhortations that we find in these chapters. Now look over in chapter 15, verse 5, and you'll see the absolute goal of all of these chapters. I think you would know it if I asked you, even apart from these chapters. But it is good to be reminded of the goal. Verse 5 now of chapter 15, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, notice, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify. There it is. Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we take up 12 and 13 and 14, that's our goal. We are pressing into and pressing onward to glorify the Father in heaven. Certainly, I think all of us, all, all of us know the chief end of man, right? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But I think our problem is we've considered that a little bit too individualistically. I think if the Lord continues to shape my thinking, really that becomes the purpose of the church. And we should not think about that in such individualistic terms because we've been called into community. And as a body, together we will glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and so if I can get everyone in the building to take up that goal, 14 and 15 will be easy because we can only do that with one accord and with one voice. And if we don't have one accord and one voice, we're going to fall short of glorifying the God and Father. There's so much about our life we're missing because we fall short in the understanding of the necessity of community within the body of Christ. So we've got to go all the way back and, and allow God to plug that into every thought we formerly had. We do these things together. Do you do them individually? Certainly. But the pursuit is in unity because we are to do them in Christ. Will some fall farther behind at times than others? Certainly. But because we're of unity and We've been brought together in a union. That's okay because the others can come alongside and encourage them and lift them and pick them up. There's a lot here for us to learn. But I think the first thing that we need to take hold of is this is our goal to glorify God. And we are to do that together in unity and in community.
The second thing that I want to remind you of is that we have an example before us. Now certainly, I think many of you learn by example. Instruction is good and you need to hear instruction. If you didn't need to hear it, we wouldn't have the Word of God. And I think instruction is primary. But for application, you need an example. And certainly we've been given the example par excellence, right? Look back in verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look over in chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore accept one another just as what? Just as Christ also accepted us. So even when we roll into 14 and 15, we're not without an example of accepting one another. We have the example that's gone before us and it's Christ Himself. And when you look at 12 and 13 and all these principles that we are instructed by the Apostle Paul to do, you have to understand, we, you have to understand we've already had an example to go before us to do these very things. We've already had the example of someone loving their neighbor like himself. We've already had the example of someone loving their enemy. We have the greatest example for all time of someone loving their enemy as He hung on the cross, right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So we're not without instruction and and, and we're not without example. But you say, well, we have to read about His example. Yeah, let me encourage you to read it all the more and sit down and actually think about what you just read as you consider the example of Christ. When you consider that love is to hate what is evil and cling to what is good, I encourage you to reflect upon how Christ did that. Because He hated evil so thoroughly that He gave His Son to die to pay for our wickedness and our sin. He despised evil. But at the same time, He loved good. Surely the Father alone is good and everything He does is good. So the Son has loved goodness and He has loved what is good. There's not a single command that you cannot read that you cannot see in the person and character of the Son of God. He is the example for us all. But He's done even more than that, right? You think about the Apostle Paul. He instructed the church at Corinth. And such a church, right? Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In fact, if you're familiar with uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, God's even presided, provided examples for the church right now. Who is that? It's your elders. God has given us Elders, as examples, they are to shepherd the flock of God by being an example. Do we have perfect examples? No. Do we have faithful examples in this body? Yes. Do we have growing examples within this body? Yes. You see, God has been so careful with us. Not, he so wants us to take up these truths and not just feel sorry that we're not doing these things. He does not just want tears to roll down our face. He does not just want us to be broken hearted. That's just the initial process. He wants us to move on so that we are living out these truths in our very lives. And He says, I've given you an instruction I've given you the example par excellence and I've given you living examples within the context of your own body. And may I take you one step further, you have an example in your own home. You have a dad. You have a husband. And he's the example. And I know that's a load to bear, man but that's the load you've been given to carry. And so you are to be the example to lead your family in the way of Christ. So we have a goal. We have someone who has done it for us. And let me remind you, it was His doing of these things that has justified us. It's His doing of these things that has perfected us. It is His doing these things that has made God to accept us, right? Right? 
So now let me take the pressure off. It is not your doing that perfects anything. It's not your doing that justifies anything. You're just an example to point others to the one who does. And so we must be faithful, not only remembering our goal, but remembering the example that has gone before us. So the first example that I want us to take us to this morning as we just consider really three is back in Hebrews. So turn with me back to Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to read it through it with some commentary because I want you to lay hold of a few truths as we walk through these things. And these are the words of the Lord Jesus before He comes. That's why we have Hebrews 10 verse 5, Therefore, when He comes into the world, He says, The sacrifice and offering you have not desired in reference to the Old Covenant, where they sacrifice the animals to atone for their sin. He says, those you have not desired, but notice a body you have prepared for me because those sacrifices could never pay for the sins of a man. Yet, so the Son of God comes as fully God with a body prepared. He takes on human flesh, fully God, fully man, in order that He might pay for our sins. Notice verse 6. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have taken no pleasure. Verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come, notice, to do your will. So the sacrifice of Christ was the very will of God. Notice with me down in verse 10, By this will, we understand what that will is, you and I have been sanctified, we've been made holy, we've been set apart to God, through and through only the offering of the what? The body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest, he says in verse 11, stands daily ministering, offering time after time those old covenant sacrifices which could never take away sin. But Christ, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, set down at the right hand of God. Notice verse 14, For by one offering He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So the Son comes humbly. The Son comes willingly to do the very will of God, and the will of God was that He might give His life as a sacrifice. And when I say His life, I mean His life blood. He was poured out unto death. His life was consumed. His life was extinguished. That was the will of God that He might be a sacrifice for our sins. Now I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And I want to remind you of another sacrifice. This one is much easier but must be offered nonetheless. Notice Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. What mercies? Huh. The mercies that the perfect Son of God gave His life on your behalf. Those mercies. The mercies that His sacrifice sanctified you and perfected you for all time. Those mercies that made you right with God. Now based on those mercies, watch what he says, you to present your, here's this word again, your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. You see, there's another sacrifice to make. And it's not like the other sacrifice in this sense. It accomplishes two di very different things. But at the same time, it accomplishes two equally same things. And number one, it accomplishes the glory of God. The sacrifice of Christ glorified the Father. The sacrifice of Christ fulfilled the will of God. And so when we consider our sacrifice that we're called to make here in Romans 12, you've got to understand that this glorifies the Father. You've also got to understand that this is the will of the Father. Because if you'll read on down, he'll take that up in verse 2, so that you may prove what the will of God is. This is the will of God for you. 
But herein lies the difference. His sacrifice glorified the Father by giving it unto death. Our sacrifice glorifies the Father as we live the life that He has given us in Christ. There's still a sacrifice to make. And until you're willing to make that sacrifice, I really don't think there's a need in going on in 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 because there's a death that has to take place. And that death is to unto yourself. That death is to your lordship and your leadership. That death is to your opinion and your way. You see, that's got to die. You can't pick up your way you can't pick up your thinking. You can't pick up your doing. You can't take up your satisfying yourself and your desires and your pleasures and go the way of Christ. That's not the will of God. That doesn't glorify the Father. There's a sacrifice that needs to be made not just in coming to faith, but in every day of faith. In fact, I would go on to say in every moment of every day. There is a death that needs to take place and it is your death. Because we so readily and so quickly with pleasure take up our way and do our things. So we have to remember there's been an example of a sacrifice. And his was unto death. But the sacrifice that we've been called to is unto life. Both is the will of God. Both glorifies the Father. And both, one was made, but it's necessary for both to be made. And I hope you got in your mind standing before an altar. Now, yes, the altar's been torn down because there's no other need for physical sacrifices, but you do understand, you stand there every day considering whose way am I going to walk today, whose way am I going to choose, whose things am I going to do. Will it be mine or will it be His? And once that decision is made, then you can move forward into the other things that we've been called to. So I want to give you two attitudes that must be necessary for your life to take these things up. And let me go on to say this. Please don't think of anything in 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 apart from the attitudes that Christ displayed. In fact, I'm convinced that if you take up the attitudes, you will already, by default, be walking in obedience to the things that you read and you struggle with. When you read those things about love your enemy, well, don't take that up before you understand the attitudes in which Christ took that up. The first attitude that we come to is the humility of Christ. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Let me remind you of probably what you've already committed to memory. Notice Philippians 2 verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to or grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death. On a cross. There is no greater display of humility than that right there. We will never comprehend the vast difference between who he was and who he became. The condescension we will forever marvel at that God himself, the one who created the one through whom all things were created, by Him and for Him and in Him, I would add, that one took on the frailty and weakness of human flesh in order that God might die. Because that was not possible for God before He became man. 
And not only did he display humility in that, but it was an entire lifetime of a display of humility toward all things in the Father. L listen to John 6, 38, when he describes himself. He says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I can't get over that statement. How is it that the Son of God would not come in independence, standing on his own two feet, proclaiming his own word? Do you realize even the miracles and the power he doesn't do separated from the Father, he does in unity with the Father? All those things that he did, speaking to the winds and the wave, making them calm in an instant, healing the sick, raising the dead, all that is the will of the Father. He said, I'm not doing my stuff. I didn't come to do my stuff. I, I came to do the will of the Father. His coming was a display of humility. Everything he spoke, those were not his words he would say. These are the words of the Father. Every action he did, he would say, this is not my will, but the will of the Father. And what does he say in the garden? Not my will will, but your will be done. In fact, his last words on earth, what were they? It is finished. What's finished? The Father's will. And the moment he spoke those words, do you remember what the text says? He bowed his head and breathed his last. I've got nothing to do here on my own. There's nothing that I want to do on my own. There's no words I want to speak. There's no actions that I want to take. There's nowhere I want to go. There's nothing I want to see. I've come to do the will, O oh God. It was written down in the book of the scroll. And so I have come to do the will. And in my last breath, I proclaim I have completed the will of the Father. And He draws His last breath and He gives up His Spirit because that was His job. That is the example of our humility that we are supposed to take up. Oh, how far, how far we are from that. Because when you think about humility in the depraved man, the lost man, there's not one ounce, one shred of humility in that man. In fact, to be lost means that you in pride puff up your chest against God and proclaim to Him that you are your own God. That's what it is to be lost. That's what it means to not be in Christ, is to be filled with pride and arrogance, thinking for a moment that you can make your own way. But once we're born again, then humility begins to dawn in our heart because we've been saved through the humility of Christ, but we also have the Spirit of Christ living within us in order that we might display this great humility. Notice with me back in Romans chapter 12. Notice the very thing He goes to right after the sacrifice that He calls us to make. Look at Romans chapter 12 verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. You can't even go forward from here until you settle this issue in your heart. In fact, what keeps you crying in 12 and 13 and not moving on to obedience in 12 and 13 is pride. You know, for those of you who've been with us on Wednesday, we just started walking through Jeremiah. I know what a mighty task I committed to do there. But we walked through Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 55 this week, and, and listen to what the Lord says in a, as an indictment against the people. He says, Behold, you have spoken and done evil things, and you've had your way. You've had your way. That's what it means to be filled with pride. 
that's what it means to walk against the will of God. That's what it means to not glorify God, to have your own way. And let me take you into another picture because my mind went off into these places. That's the issue of sin. Every time we're drawn to do what we know dishonors God, what we know to be disobedient with God, here we stand before the Father saying, will it be my way or will it be your way? And it takes a humble heart to go, it will not be my way, it will not be my will, I will not please myself, I will not live in my own authority, I will humble my heart and follow His way. See, there's no need in going on in 12. We've got we to consider the sacrifice and we've got to consider the right heart attitude before we begin to take up any of these things. He displayed humility that we can never plumb the depths of. How God would become man, I do not know. But I know why He did it. And I know without Him doing it, you and I have absolutely no hope. But because He did it, we now have hope. So when we consider that through humility, great things have happened for us, can we come to the understanding that if I would continue in humility, great things I would accomplish to the glory of God? Because in humility, I will begin to take on the character of the Son of God. But only in humility. You cannot begin to hate what is evil and love what is good apart from having a humble heart. You'll never do that. To love your neighbor as yourself without humility, that's not even a possibility. You understand. So when I tell you don't take up these things until you first put on the character of Christ, I mean very clearly what I say. You can't do these apart from Him. So take up the character of Him Beg God for humility. Repent when you're not in humility. And walk in humility. Fast for humility. Pray for humility. Because if you get humility down, the rest of these things are going to be simple. Really simple. It's not because you won't think less of yourself. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking you not to think of yourself. That is certainly what God did for us. How else could a perfect, spotless man die for sinners? Well, the only way he could do that is because he was not thinking of himself. He was thinking of others. So weep, we must. Repent, we must. But until you go on to humility, that's where you'll stop. And you'll repeat the things that you do not want to do and never be able to take up those things that you so desperately want to do. Second attitude, and let me take you back to Romans 5, and this is the last, and we're not far from being finished this morning. We come back here often. Second attitude is love. And I struggle to call that an attitude because I spent most of my last 10 years here trying to convince you that love is an action. But this morning, we need to see it as an attitude. Notice Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates... His own love, His particular, peculiar love toward us. And this is the context in which He did that. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like as I said, there's no greater display of humility. There's no greater display of love. You can't begin to fathom the depth of the love that God has for us. He literally, physically gave His only Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Out of His love. Out of display of that love. But the context is so important for us to understand. It was love 
that had to be expressed in the face of opposition or you don't even begin to understand the depth of it. It was given while you and I were yet rebellious. It was given while you and I were sinners. And if it had not been given in that context, we would not understand the depth of it. Many people reflect on Genesis 3 and, and why all that took place. And I can't answer all of that question. But I can give you this. If it had not been for Genesis 3, we would have never gloried in John 3.16. What love is this? What love has been shown us when we were unloving, unlovable, and rebellious, and God displayed His great love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we've been called not only to take up that humility, but to also take up that love. Go back to Romans 12 with me and look at all this love that you and I are supposed to manifest in our life. Let's begin with verse 9. Let love be unhypocritical without hypocrisy. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in what? Brotherly love. Look at chapter 13, verse 8. Owe nothing, owe absolutely nothing to anyone except this, to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the very law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the very fulfillment of the law. Look over into chapter 15. Without mentioning the word, you understand the love. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength and not, notice, not just, and just is added in the italics, I, I don't like it there, and not please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his neighbor's good to his neighbor's edification. Why? Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. But as it stands written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell upon me. That's love. We're never going to escape the necessity of this truth in our life. So when we learn to take up humility, and when we learn to take up love in our hearts, we will begin to look at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 as, as foregone conclusions. As if we could have written these things down ourselves. Obviously, this is how we would treat our enemy. To which others would look at us and go, how bizarre you would say that. And you'd go, no, it's not bizarre at all. That's how I have been treated. Of course I would be selfless in service toward my neighbor. Of course I would display love toward my neighbor by considering his needs before my own. And the world would go, how bizarre is that? That you would not take care of number one. And you'd go, no, it's not bizarre. It makes perfect sense because the Lord Jesus Christ took my sin upon himself. Not pleasing himself, but rather doing what was necessary for my soul in service to me. It's not bizarre. It's obvious. When we begin to take up these things, and I really, I, I, I whittled it down for two. When we begin to take up the humility of Christ, and, and, and let me just go ahead and say, that's going to be a struggle for you. Humility is not a personality. Some people think that people that are soft-spoken or, or, or introverted or humble, that's not humility. This is talking about humility of heart. This is talking about seeing others above yourself and, and seeing yourself as a servant. I was contemplating that this morning, before, just before I came in here. And I had a nervousness about me this morning. Couldn't quite put my finger on why. 
And then it dawned on me who I was preaching before. I'm preaching before two young boys over here, Carson and Cooper. And you go, why does that make you nervous? Because it dawned on me this morning that they are the children of God. Who am I? Who am I to raise my voice or even make words before these two? Do you know what price God paid for those two? Do you know how high and holy these two are? Have you considered who they belong to? If you did, you would change what you think about yourself. In fact, you would tie an apron about your waist and you would go get a pan of water and you would serve them if you understood who they were. You see, humility is a struggle. It's just so commonplace for us not to be humble. To think of ourselves more important than others. To walk in a room or walk in a church and immediately begin to think of all the things that we need from the temperature to the particular seats to how we want to be talked to and how we want to be met. Y'all, we're, we can be children sometimes when we ought to be adults. You know, I thought about this as well, and I'll, I'll be finished this morning. I thought if the world recognized who we are, they wouldn't dare approach us lest they be on their knees. But if we were like Christ, we would already be on our knees before them. They wouldn't have time to get down on the ground because we're already there. That's the humility that we need in our lives. And when we begin to arrive at that place as a church, all these wonderful truths that we read, that we weep over because we're not doing, would genuinely be a part of who we are. And when I roll into 14 and 15 and it says, and accept one another, you'd already have your arms around one another. You're like, this? yeah, that. You get it. It all begins and ends with the phrase in verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been given for us. Now let's take Him up and manifest His glory before this lost and dying world and let's do it until He comes again. Amen. Let's pray.